Hey guys, this is Charlie Bathgate here from St. Lucie. Um, I'm joined by Chris Cady. I'm, I'm pronouncing your last name, right, Cady? Chris? All okay, right, yeah. Yeah, okay, Chris Cady. Um, and I will let him give you guys a more in-depth explanation on his background and and uh, both trading-wise and meditation-wise here in a second. Um, just want to make sure, can everybody see and hear me? I yeah, click on in the chat, Chris can. And if you can see and hear Chris as well, please let us know. Um, good to go, that not saying. Nope, Rudy, this is not saying. Um, I am Sang's partner. I'm the psychology freak amongst the, this team over here at Sang Lucci. Um, so yeah, I am I'm not saying, but I promise you it'll be a good, worthwhile interview no matter what. So <laughs> stick with me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hey, to Clint. It's out there in Canada somewhere. Yeah, yeah. Chris got some some old friends joining in here to probably give him shit after the uh, after it's over. So it's always good. Um, all right, I think we're gonna have a couple more people trickling in here. But Chris, let's uh, let's get started, man. Let's kick this off. So to begin with, if you don't mind taking well, first you're. You're on the floor of the CME right now, right? The old yeah, floor. What's left of the CME here in New York is is uh, yeah, we're here at right on the edge of the Hudson River. Right. Uh, Amex and and uh, Comex are still in residence. Right. Yeah. And so, um, can you give a quick background in terms of you know your trading experience, where you started, your evolution up to where you've gotten right now, and then real quick. We can talk about the meditation experience and the relevance of that trading, but let's start yeah. with. Uh, well, of course, everybody knows that the world has changed dramatically from when we all started to learn how to trade. So, not that it really matters, but a quick history is: I got my membership in 1980, and uh, never really did anything else other than trade. I had some great teachers at Chairman New York Stock Exchange: Victor Sperandio, uh, Peter Stottlemyre, all uh, leaders in their fields, and uh, they of course had great clients and customers that I would talk to and uh, have had you know the usual ups and downs as everybody does who trades and um, would love to be able to share with you guys a little bit about first what to try and strive for from a mental perspective and then second of all uh, where we can take it and how we can grow uh, in this evolving field where it essentially is, is wide open because no one's figured out how to do it correctly yet and that's the kind of opportunity that we want. We want to be in places where nobody's figured out. Uh, that means the opportunity is unlimited if we can do it correctly. And right. so with Charlie here, we'll, we'll delve into at least the mental footprint and blueprint and maybe structure that can possibly help you or at least prevent you from making unnecessary mistakes. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, just to give, a, I mean, you've traded pretty much every asset class, right, Chris? Yeah, I mean, generally speaking, uh, you definitely want to be where the party is. And so that's I, that's prompted you to move between, you know, which is all to say that you have pretty much anything that anybody in here is is trading. Um, you've traded it before, right? I mean, most for the most part, everyone in here is going to be equity options and some futures, but you know, there might be some some forex guys and whatnot. You've traded mm -hmm. all. Yeah, I mean. Uh, the general thinking from the guys who run big bond desks are that uh, currencies are a relationship. Uh, they, they, they exist. They're a necessary evil to conduct, conduct business. Uh, equities have been generally things that have been uh, growing in volume and price ever since 1980. Uh, the physicals are interesting to trade uh, because they are both made, grown, and consumed. Uh, and the only thing I haven't really traded is Bitcoin, and I'm sure in a couple of weeks when we have the futures contract, we'll all get a chance to spin yeah. the wheel. Yeah. Oh God. Well, we'll save Bitcoin for another for another time. Um, but uh, all right, and then just real quick. So you also one of the reasons I wanted to bring you on is because you do have this ability to explain a lot of these concepts, some many of which can be really complicated uh, okay. and really difficult to explain the psychological concepts and trading concepts. Um, and part of your ability to do that is comes from your training as a meditation practitioner and teacher, right? So, yeah, you know, tell these guys real quick about the program you were selected for and how you got to learn straight from the Dalai Lama and you know that whole thing. Yeah, it's uh, it was a program that was pitched to me as a four-hour class that ran eleven years uh, by 
by a lot of uh, very high, highly qualified uh, Tibetan lamas and monks and uh, teaching some in English and some in Tibetan with translators that required mandatory uh, many hours of class and mandatory meditation retreats uh, for durations of a month uh, at least once a year right. and uh, with protocol they don't just you don't just sit there and and uh, gaze at your navel they have a particular cookbook for you to to teach you the understanding of the illusions that your mind plays on yourself in regards to fear of your understanding of reality in regards to who you think you are and, and what you think in regards to uh, how the world really works and of course nobody understood it in relation to trading except myself so this is the first time I've ever gone down this road and, and explained any of it to anybody so it's nice to be able to be here. Well that's awesome and that's one of the reasons I want to bring you on. Um, so yeah let's start with a concept that every traders and meditators and, and Buddhists are very familiar with, but in different ways, and that's ego, right? Um, some people talk about trading and they say, you got to eliminate your ego entirely. You can't have any ego because ego makes you make biased decisions and whatnot. But you and I were having a conversation last week where you made a really good point about the role of ego and how it ch switches, you know, pre-trade and, and post-trade. So do you mind starting out talking a little bit about that? Well, of course, everybody, you have to have ego strength to hit the mouse. And so that's really good, right? In the, in the discussion from the Buddhist side or the monk side, they always talk about that there is no such thing as you disappearing. If you step out in front of a cab, the cab will still run you over. So the, uh, it's just an educated uh, understanding of where the ego fits in the process of the decision making in regards to trading. And so uh, once you have the ego strength, to hit the mouse, what you think, right? That's basically what you think, and then you have to understand that uh, you have to be in that situation. You you need to be prepared to be wrong. Right. Uh, it's not courage. It's it's basically, in to some degree, it's a measured degree of arrogance to sit when you hit the mouse and say, "This is the ego strength that I need to do this trade." Uh, once you do that, then the inner cheerleader that says, "Oh, this is good for me," or "This is bad for me," needs to go completely right away. Right. Uh, unless you can bury that inner cheerleader, you're, everything you see is an illusion, and uh, your 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 understanding, your ability to diagnose a trade on the fly, in a sense, like you're looking at a trade and you're saying, is there more to this, or is there not? Is this the the reasonable end of the trade? Right. Uh, is damaged by the cheerleader that exists that this is good for me or this is bad for me. Right. So, so the discernment between having the ego strength to hit the mouse and once you do to be able to step away from that viewpoint and look at, at it from a neutral perspective as though you're seeing reality clearly without how it affects the illusion of me. Right, right. Okay, so then aside from I'm sure some of the, the people in here and guys we're going to do a Q&A afterwards too so if you have questions Feel free to pop them in right now to the questions um, chat, or you can wait until we get towards the end of the webinar to ask. But um, you know, assuming that most, if you have questions about meditation and whatnot, we can certainly dive into those you know, during the Q and A. But Chris, assuming that most of the people here like are not very seasoned with meditation and they might not be that interested in meditation, um, I would assume that a lot of the self awareness that you cultivated was through meditation. But are there other ways that you kind of cultivated that skill set of turning off the cheerleader um, and or systems that you have in place now where that really help for, for doing that on a day to day basis? Yeah, I mean, uh, any flow state experience, whether it's skiing, surfing, riding your bike, playing tennis, even doing yoga, uh, where you lose the sense of yourself, how it affects me in the moment. Um, the Bhagavad Gita, chapter 18, talks about right action, where you do what you're supposed to do, irrespective of the sense of you. When you're skiing full speed, right? It's um, it's you're just doing what needs to be done. Surfing, whether you're many, many out, anything people can get. I've been told bowling, but I don't know. Uh, the idea is, is it a flow state experience, which is a kind of a catch word. Is is that sort of same understanding? The idea with meditation is that there is no agility required. You're sitting there. You're forced to confront the mind and the thoughts that travel through the mind and it teaches you some patience and compassion with yourself right essentially what we're trying to do is negotiate 
the uncertain future and and the random thoughts that come up without becoming upset in our mind and losing our concentration. And if you think about it in trading, you're constantly confronted with all this data and uncomfortable thoughts and unreasonable markets. Right. And that you have to negotiate that with a sense of ability to not have that cheerleader, to be able to be lucid in regards to well, you know, what is really happening. Right, right. And so that means <clears throat> when, once you kind of kill that inner, the voice of that inner cheerleader, as you were as you were describing it, right. uh, then what's guiding your decision making process at that point is your own strategy and, and systems that you have in place, your rules for yourself, correct? Yeah, I mean, you 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 had an objective in mind when you made the trade. You were right. looking for something to happen, um, and so if it's not going to happen, you need to exit that trade immediately and then start and look for more geographically better places to start your supposed trade campaign or whatever it is. Yeah, but, when you say geographically geographical, you know, favorable positions, like, can you unpack that? that oh, sure. Um, uh, the, this guy, George, he used to run TNS. Uh, when I see him every now and then, he was a very successful trader. He talked about looking for, he viewed it as a, like a military campaign, which was strange to me, uh, that you're always looking for geographical places to defend. Right. In other words, uh, using your charts as though, is this a spot that I would have a good good chance of other people, or is this a safe place to sell or a safe place to buy based on the prior chart patterns? Right. So um, just an interesting concept for those people with a military disposition. Right. Uh, look at it as a geographical place of, is it safe? Is it is it a defendable position? And if not, you get out and you look for another defendable position. Right, right. Okay. Understood. Um, and so, when it comes to um, you know, one of the other things that we were talking about was the the difference between um, you know, once you've entered into once you've entered into a trade, you know, how when you're managing that trade, um, like, and for you right now, right? I mean, even though you're a seasoned trader, obviously t more experienced than probably everyone in this room combined, um, are there still snags that grab you right now? Um, are there still things that, that trip you up and how do you, you have systems in place, rules in place, you have reminders on your computer, anything like that that help you, you know, stay out of the pitfalls you typically fall into? Sure. Um, the, uh, this sign is uh, from uh, John Yates. He's a, a neuroscientist. It says craving, aversion, and intention. Okay. Uh, make sure that your actions aren't uh, driven uh, by craving or aversion, you know, do I really want to be short in the S and P? You know, why is that? Right? You have to let. You're, you're trying to be in step with an organic process. You want to make sure you're not driven by craving, aversion, and intentions. But back to your question about diagnosing on the fly. Uh, Pete Stottlemyre used to always say that he didn't know how far the trade was going to go until he was actually in it, and that he would say. Uh, you know, maybe there, his words were, maybe there's more to this, is the way he would describe it. And I think that really begs that uh, you understand that there's no inner cheerleader that you're trying to diagnose in the present moment. And in these markets, right, time has been condensed, right? So the moves are going to happen faster and quicker. And so what used to take a day now takes an hour. So, so, you know, everybody needs to make sure that they've shortened their timelines and their expectations. The market will give you that day's move in an hour, so you just take it. it and then you start and start over and start the process over. And, uh, you know, try and, try and understand that, you know, that you're starting over, so the, it's like you, you constantly are being, a, being taught that, you don't know, and right. so you need to have that curiosity when you step up to the plate. That you know, it's like you're walking into a party, and you're walking up the stairs, and you don't know how that party's going to be until you get there, right? And you could you could walk in, and you'll be happy at that party in ways you never thought. You could be. It's like we're an artist. A friend of mine, Wags, used to say, uh, you know, you don't know if you're going to be a sculptor, or a charcoal artist, a painter, or an actor. Every day when we show up here, it's just right. like have to be able to be flexible in that regard. Got to be able to adapt no matter what's what's happening. 
right? Yeah, I mean, markets, gener markets generally have to be unreasonable because everything's been coded. Anything that's happened prior has been coded. So mm -hmm. the, the you have to think that the markets are going to go to to places that are considered crazy or things that are going to happen. It's going to go up 18 days in a row because it's never happened before. Right. The mental pliancy to be able to cope with with something that hasn't happened. Right. Super important, and that requires that you're patient with yourself, and super compassionate with yourself, and curious and courageous. Right? It's like we could take a list of character traits and values from a positive psychology textbook. Right. Say, right. If you don't, if you don't, if you don't, if you're not feeling this way today, maybe make your size smaller. Right. right? Well, that, and that's and that gets us into you. I know how we were talking a little bit about sort of pre-market prep. Right. That you would. You would recommend people who are just kind of beginning, like, okay, what if you're trying to get your head straight going into your know, market open, like, you know, where would you start in terms of like putting those positive psychology traits like at, at top of mind? You know? Yeah, you know, you wake up in the morning. Are if you're hungover, it's going to be a lot tougher than if you're well rested, right? You'll have a lot less patience. Right. So, um, and then understanding your limitations with yourself, right? You know, did you get thrown out of the house a lot? Like I did because I was rebellious. And are you fighting with the markets because that's just your trait? Right. Um, uh, you need to. There's a, a thing in family therapy where they talk about you know when you're approaching a confusing situation in family therapy, you can choose either anxiety or you can choose to be curious. Right. And so, so given that we probably should choose to be curious, you want to monitor your breath for anxiety, right? You want to make, if you're holding your breath when you're trading, you either need to make your stop closer, you need to trade smaller, or you need to just back off until you're, you can use that. You just look at your breath, see if you're holding your breath, because it's a perfect mental check. It's a mental function, your breath. There's no one holding your throat. Well, so, even, not, even not just your breath, right? Like physical sensations, like tightness in your chest. Right. Now, I'm not having a heart attack, but, you know, like if you're sitting there and your shoulders are all clenched, you know, up. Uh, <laughs> You can feel in your body the anxiety, and you can use that as a barometer for okay, I'm feeling anxious right now instead of excitement. That's not the best for clean, clear thinking. And then from that point, you know, if you can make sure that you're not completely physically exhausted and you're not mentally angry from fighting with somebody, then you just have to decide, you know, do we want to trade, right? You want to make sure that when you show up to trade, you really want to trade today, right? right? Right. And then you have to decide also how big to trade, right? There are some days where you walk into the casino and you play the the two dollar roulette table, and there are days where you play the five hundred dollar table, right? right? And so if, if you're trying to play the five, and then you need to adjust yourself to the market's conditions as well. If the market's not moving, you're wasting your time and energy and potentially your money in a situation you have to decide that something's really happening before right. you go out there and you risk your money on something in a situation that's not really, you go to a party, there's nobody there. It's like, no matter how much you want someone to show up at the party, they're still not there. So you have to, you know, so you decide how big you want to trade. Right. And then, uh, and then it, right from that point is when we're talking about the ego strength to hit the mouse. And, and then that process starts. But that the, the initial checklist is, is just make sure you're well rested, make sure that you're not angry, make sure you're curious, make sure you right, you have all those character traits that that allow you to face adversity in in a in a way that you're in step with an organic process. Right, right. Um, yes, absolutely. Um, <laughs> yeah, we'll clean up after the that. That's fine. Um, yeah. So you know, in terms of Developing that ego, and one of the things that we talked about is, is the best thing a, a, a trader can do is put incremental, like especially when you're starting out, get some wins on the board, right? Can you speak a little bit more into that? Yeah. Yeah, you want you in a sense, right? You want the girl to call you back. You go on a first date, and and you know you want you don't want to marry her on the first date, right? You want to just have small incremental gains, right? And if you think about it, where is it easy to predict? The next five seconds, right? Let's just make this simple. I can predict the next five seconds much easier than the next five minutes, than the next five hours, right? right? So it, if you're just starting out, right, shorten the duration of your trades, right? Keep the objective small. Go for a small positive cash flow over time and continue with that discipline because in a sense, trading is a disciplined game that's predicated on probability. 
So you need to become comfortable with the idea that over time you will have a winning track record. Right. So that will give you confidence to hit the mouse. So the idea is, is the shortest duration trades for small profits and now these days it's easy with the with the electronic trading and it's very easy because commissions are cheap. So shorten your duration. Use some sort of systematic approach whether it's revision to the mean or breakout strategy. That being said, provision to the mean has a greater probability of winning over time than the breakouts, though the breakouts tend to be bigger gains. Right. Right. So, yeah, a great point, right? Like we need to get that positive cash flow. And you get that positive cash flow, and then you can start to expand your horizons, whether it's time or it's in size. Right. But and, uh, and when, when, one, uh, one quick caveat is that is that the uh, when markets are moving slow like they are now you have to resist the temptation to to execute when you can the more difficult executions like executing into a fast market that's going to move faster is is the way to make money now if the market's going sideways like it did all day today be really careful of executing into a situation where you feel comfortable right even if you're saying if the market's moving sideways, even if you feel comfortable, you know, be careful. You're saying make yeah, sure you're very comfortable if I'm, the market. I'm I'm saying that the 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 fact that the market's giving you a chance to execute at your price may not be the best idea. Gotcha. When the market's moving sideways. Right. Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. My point is again is like you want to you want to execute into a fast moving market that's moving faster. Right. Yes. Into strength. Right. Okay, so it's like you you want to you want the wave to be steeper, you want the hill to fall away from you when you're skiing, right? You want the 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 bicycle to be picking up speed. It's like you've just crested a hill on your bicycle, and you see that there's a long downhill in front of you. You want to be on that part, right, where you, where the bike's picking up speed, but you see that you're going to be going faster in front of you, right? Right. Those are, yep. those are the places that are the easiest way to make money. And and one of the other things that dovetails with this is you've talked about, um, you and I have talked about how being in the markets, the more trades you take and the more the more you're in the market, the more you give yourself an opportunity to learn about yourself, right? Which yeah. is which is priority number one for any trader, really having an understanding of themselves and the, you know, what they bring to the table psychologically trading. So can you speak a little more about that process? Yeah, that that's uh, Dave Stone. He has uh, five kids and five dogs, was one a huge gold trader. And I used to ask him, you know, when he got cold, what did he do? Because everybody, all the, the general tendency is is to move away, right? Just like you fight with somebody and you just drop the, you right. just drop and move away. But right. he would always say that you trade more, you trade smaller. You trade right. more until you get back in step. And I think just generally speaking, we're trying to make sure that we're in step with an organic process. Right. Right? It's a roller coaster that is running 24-7 you know, all the time. So where you choose to step on and where you choose to step off the roller coaster is completely up to you. Right. So you need to make sure that you're not out of sync, right? The worst thing is, is about you're buying the high and selling the low, and then you're getting emotionally frustrated and continue to do that. Right. So um, if you do experience that, either um, trade very small, like Dave says, or and trade actively, or then just try and, and get into a sync by just looking for those geographical locations. If you're trying to pick tops, wait for a rally. Don't sell the whole. Which is uh, here's a great thing that everybody should be aware of, right? What are the, the four ways to, to approach the market, right? You can buy high, you can buy low, you can sell high, and in the case of stocks, the one thing we have not been able to do is to sell low, right? So, um, so you have they haven't been able to do it, meaning just you not cannot, working. yeah, you yeah. cannot cannot sell weakness, right? You haven't been able to sell weakness and get away with it. And I'm sure every S&P trader out here is, is shaking their head with me and, and acknowledging it, right? That, so, of course, the temptation is, is, is like, oh, today's the day I can sell weakness, but consider it a suicide mission if you're doing it, people. Right. <laughs> All right. Don't take a suicide mission, guys. Um, so, one of the things that we have talked about, um, you and I have discussed a little bit, is the concept of people whose needs that aren't being met are easier to predict. To predict their behavior is easier to predict. Um, yeah. You give an analogy of you know you give an analogy often of 
meet a girl at a bar, ask her out, you know, her behavior, how predictable that is, right? Can you, like, walk through that analogy and then kind of explain it in relationship to trading? Yeah, right. Think about it, right? If if you, if someone has, let's say, they have a uh, hundred shares of Amazon and they bought it at sixty bucks in two thousand and nine, and now it's trading eleven twenty six, their behavior is probably really impossible to predict. They're at PJ Clark's having a third martini, and like you know, like oh, hurt me, right? I can't get hurt on this. But if someone's got a million shares of Amazon at right here at the money at eleven twenty six. Um, and it starts to go bad, we know they got to go, right? They have to go. They can't stay there with that kind of exposure. Right. So the, the, the predictable thing is people who aren't getting what they want are easier to predict than the people who are getting what they want. And Charlie and I laugh about that in dating, right? If, if you're having a great time on a date, it's, un, it's very hard to predict. But if, if she's not having a great time on a date, in my case, she puts $20 on the bar and says, I'm going to cut this short and walk out. So um, in trading, same sort of thing, right? If you, and so you can see the market's expectations from where people have been buying and, and or where their inventory is. And you can, you can generally trade with confidence when you see someone's needs aren't being met. Right. That's uh, an important thing to understand, right? If the market's getting what it wants, then you really are flipping a coin. You have no idea. Right. So uh, that's, you know, the corollary of that is like a failed sell signal is a better buy signal hmm. than, a, than, a, than a buy signal. And a failed buy signal is a better sell signal than a sell signal. Right. That's a that's a people's expectations not getting fulfilled, right? Right. And think about that from an ego perspective, right? If if you think that something's going to happen, and it doesn't, you first have to unwind your ego's investment in your prediction, right? Before you can get on board the train the right way. Yep. Does that make sense? So that it's much better to have an open mind rather than a mind that's predicated on a certain prediction coming true. Yeah, that's and that's and that gets into being able to flip sides in your trade. You know, you're going in you're short. You know, the market is, is disproving that thesis. You know, being able to flip it and, and go long. You know, pretty quickly. That's something that Lucci. You know, if everyone is familiar here with Lucci and, and been in the steam room with him, that's something that he's often really really good at. Despite that, he does have a big ego. You know, um, <laughs> like he knows Lucci. He knows he's got a huge ego, but um, you know, he can flip that really quickly and that's that's something that's really hard for even I feel like veteran traders to do. Um, really hard and, and, and Pete Sotomayor would frequently say in his uh, small classes he would say the people who believed the most in the trade made the most. Right. But you know which stands in, in stark corollary to what we're talking about but right. um, when you say the people who believed in the trade the most made the most what do you mean? Can you unpack that? You know in in uh, the idea in, in uh, building a trend following system um, is that how much tolerance do you build into your trend following system? If you build in too little tolerance, you get stopped out before the move uh, really completes itself. And if you build in too much tolerance, you give back too much of your profits at the end. Right. Right. So the idea was, Pete was saying that if you were convinced of something, you were willing to sustain a great amount of move against you in the in the in the journey to wherever this was going, and say Amazon from 60 to 1100, right? If you really believed Amazon, and I'm sure there are people who do, and really, and they were right up to this point, right? Um, if you really believed Amazon was going up, it didn't matter if Amazon went from 600 to 400 on the way, right? Now here at 1100, and same with Apple, right? Like there's been draw downturns in Apple, but there are people right. who are religiously believing in that. So the understanding is, is that you need to, you need to have, a, from a mental perspective, you need to understand how much do you believe in the trade, where are you wrong, are, are your tolerances excessive, are your tolerances not excessive enough, and, um, and behave accordingly. Just having that mental conversation in your mind, being aware of these mental conversations is important. That's all I'm saying. Right, right. Um... And guys, feel free to start dropping questions in here too. If you have questions for Chris, for Chris, um, you know we, we're covering a lot of ground here, so definitely feel free to, to drop questions in there that you want to get answered. Um, Chris, we're talking about some, you know, the some of the conversations you have with with people who are more at your level of experience, right? That are more advanced and frustrations that they have. Yeah. So, what, 
know, in terms of advice that you often find yourself giving to those more advanced traders, like what you know, can you speak a little bit to that? Um, it, it's a great, great ability to be able to release yourself from logic. Generally, logic is subjective, and as you get more experienced, you tend to think that you have some sort of track record. You understand the, the parameters from from what is considered a normal move, or the boundaries from which particular markets feel comfortable operating in. And so, the understanding of uh, cheap or expensive of something is is essentially uh, in your own mind. Um, most people, if, you, if you're experienced, you need to release yourself from the need for things to make sense and just have to be, there are so many things, how, how should we say, there are so many things happening outside of our little world that affect the price of everything that we can't see that you need to understand that if it doesn't make sense, it's just because you aren't seeing the thing that's affecting it right in front of you right now. And so if you release yourself from logic, it allows you to get in step with the process that's happening that may not appear to make sense. Does that make sense? In a way, yeah. you have to be, you have to understand that cheap or expensive of something is in your own mind, right? And so uh, that's very important. Another thing we're talking about is the need for uh, newsletters, for example. Um, I'm not a cycles guy, but there's a guy who does cycles work, and uh, and so you're you're always curious about what the other people who are somewhat vested in their years uh, thinking about a particular thing, and and so the temptation is is to like I'll just subscribe to this because I don't do that work, but generally what ends up happening is is you're mad at the guy, you're mad at yourself for following the guy, and right. then and then you're mad at yourself for paying for the guy, and in a sense you. The, the the real self-esteem here that you get in this business is coming from being in step with an organic process, understanding that you have no control over it, and just exiting with a profit. Um, all comes from yourself, and and the newsletter writer guy is not invested in that process. So my caution to the more experienced people in this room would be um, as as drastic and as as hard fought knowledge as as you, as it is to do it yourself. Um, you know, unfortunately, there there are no secrets. We're not we're not giving away secrets. Uh, people used to say, "You're on the floor, you see things," and uh, that's not the case, right? It's right. Uh, so yeah. Be do the you know remain curious, do the work yourself, and right. uh, and be really quick to admit you're wrong as you get older, because the temptation is to to say, "Oh, I'm just early," and uh, and sometimes that works, but you just have to remain remain respectful of your opposers and the trades. I would suggest. But um, yeah, my advice to to the old people: congratulations, you've made it this far. Uh, right. You're always welcome to come here. And have that. Right, right. Um, okay, guys. So let's yeah, let's see if if, if people have questions. Let's start. Um, uh, we're seeing a couple come in here. These are great. Let's let's keep them coming. Um, and before we hop into those, I um, wanted to let everybody know that you're probably all familiar with the Sanguchi Master Course. If you're not, you can check it out, sanguchi.com forward slash MC. Uh, we're lucky enough that Chris has agreed to join us for this next session of the Master Course, which starts up in December, for a much more in-depth discussion about trading psychology and the things that he can pass on to, um, you know, to our audience as a result of all of his experience across you know, many different asset classes to trade every pretty every type of market environment you can imagine in this time. So, um, our, jo our job our job is to help you make money, generally speaking, right? That's that's right. as a teacher, right? I I that would be my only concern is that uh, first, you know, positive cash flow, and then uh, again we're talking about being able to create a uh, an emotional and psychological blueprint that's scalable across markets. So that that's the future, and be aware of that, right? Like you're going to have to be able to think in a way that works across all markets, because that is where the real money is going to be made. Not just watching one thing, but having a, a framework that, will, uh, whether it's computerized or other people, that can use the same sort of framework to across multiple opportunities, and that's right. where we're going to make the real money. Right. Yep. Absolutely. And the good part about having 
someone with Chris's trading background, who's also this into Buddhism and meditation, is that he believes in just good karma and helping other people. So you know, you're going to benefit from, from his philosophy. How's this? I have the patience. Yeah. I have the patience because I've been there with it, and so we always say every trade a story. So the idea is not to get bogged down in, in some sort of every trade a story, but there is the understanding that we're in the same boat, right. and we can be very helpful in that regard. Right. Uh, William dropped a, a, a really good comment in here talking about when he first started trading, he beat himself up more. He got out early. He would say, "Damn, you know, I got up too early, but I didn't get out at all. I tanked, beat myself up, um, couldn't win." Now it doesn't bother me so much. I realize I won't get it right, but no big deal. Like they say, it's like driving, looking ahead. Meditation helps bring your intuition or gut feelings. Um, interesting, nirvana means cessation of the mind. You blow out the candle of the mind and work from the heart, which is a whole level above the mind. Um, I mean, would you, like, do you feel yourself, like Chris, some people when they trade, especially guys who are much more advanced, who have a lot more experience, like they can feel in their body, right? Lucci talks about like when the tape, <laughs> Do you feel like there's a relationship between that and your meditation practice and everything? Uh, first, uh, addressing that comment, yeah, that's that's right. I mean, there is a, an understanding that um, over time, confidence builds up to sustain small negative moves against us. Um, and so, um, Chitter and Riti Narodaha, the cessation of the endless turning over of the mind, is a yoga term. Um, so the, yeah, that's all part of the flow state experience. Um, uh, I, now I just I just do forget. I'm sorry, I forget what you were just asking. No, um, that's all right. That that hit on it. Oh oh oh. oh um, and then uh, the the flow state experiences. Oh, when you what? Yes, you get to a spot in a trade where you cannot physically stop yourself from hitting the mouse, mm -hmm. where, where you feel it like every. And so that's the subconscious of the intuitive feeling that's talking to you, and you want to cultivate that feeling at, at, at the cost of a losing trade, right? If you have that physical sensation that you really have to make that trade, make the trade. Make sure you have a stop and honor, honor the, the intuitive conversation that happens between you and the conscious mind. And that way that, that um, conversation will continue um, to flourish, and then you'll have more of what they call a feel. Um, also understand, though, that the unconscious is not God. Um, though the unconscious is driving the bus, it can be wrong. Right. And so yep. that's a really critical point is that, yeah, we're going to lead with our unconscious. We're going to lead with the feel that we have, that we develop, right? That it's infinitely more nuanced and, and capable of so many more um, correct decisions because it, it's, it's, I guess, it got a lot more inputs than, than our regular sensory fingers and eyes and things of that nature. Um, but again, remember it can be wrong um, and then um, keep listening to it, I guess. But the physical sensation, I would agree with completely. There are times when you cannot resist getting into the trade where you're like, I got to do this. Right. And, um, so yeah, yeah that's and great. I mean, even if you're wrong, when you feel that physical sensation, you know, you are, that's data. As long as you're not putting on so much size that you're going to blow up your account or anything, you know, that's data that you can use to fine tune your own emotional, you know, experience and calibrate that accordingly. So the next time, you're more likely to be right. Yeah. Also remember, too, where you exit in game theory is important, right? That people who exit first have the least amount of knowledge. Mm -hmm. So that um, if you sense that everybody's short and you see a first little exit um, with, or people bounce right the first thing that becomes a really important metric and so um, there are mecha mechanistic elements that fit into the unconscious um, conversation that you're cultivating and so um, that that would lead to more of a flow state experience but that I guess would be more to come but yeah people always be careful of that first retracement um, and if it does not completely revert 100 percent that becomes a huge reference point in game theory right Okay, cool. That's that's an awesome response. Thanks, Chris. Um, and then, so we have a question from Paul. Uh, Paul C. How do you simplify building your mental reserves through the different markets so you do not burn out? Uh, therapists talk about this all the time, right? It, uh, therapeutic burnout. Um, you're only capable of so much. Um, the machines, of course, never have that problem, right? So um, 
it depends how advanced you are in regards to your programming skill set at this point. Um, you should have both, I mean, where we're going with all of this is that you have a reversion to the mean and a breakout system both separately operating across multiple markets uh, with, with um, structures and curves in the case of reversions uh, that work. Um, if you're not doing any of that and you're forced to do it um, like an artist, right, as an individual with a mouse looking at one thing all the time, you need to make sure that um, you approach it from uh, a perspective of respect for the fact that people who are doing this are smarter, have been um, well capitalized, and so um, maybe take a, maybe make sure that you take appropriate amount of time off. Do not become obsessed. Um, you always, in a sense, the the opposite of burnout is curiosity, right? The opposite of burnout is courageousness, right? The opposite of 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 burnout is wanting to, when you wake up in the morning, do you want to go to work, right? Um, so if you don't, right, like what do the monks say, eat when you're hungry, sleep when you're tired, right, trade when you want to, right. that would be my advice. Right, gotcha, okay. Um, okay, how do you categorize confidence in a trade and wrong trader bias? How can you be aware of the two and trade effectively? That's from Matt, that's a good question. Uh, can you say that again, trader bias? So how do you categorize confidence in a trade and wrong trader bias? Like how do you differentiate between, you know, I. Oh. You know, how can you be aware of the two and trade effect? Okay, so right, like we're talking about, you need the ego strength to hit the mouse, right? So that the, the confidence there it doesn't seem to be the problem, right? Like they're they're getting, or or if they if they lack confidence you need to back it up and you need to make sure that you either a have a geographical place to make the trade that from the wart uh, analogy or you need to make sure that you have a, a way of segmenting data right essentially what this business is is segmenting data um, into into ways that make sense to you um, then um, these days since time is so condensed um, you need a real short leash on your losers. You need to be, ex it's very strange, and then we we're talking about this today on the floor a little bit, how it's uh, a, where we are very patient when we're right, but we have no tolerance for the trade as soon as we're wrong. And so that uh, you need to give yourself an extremely short leash. As soon as, do not indulge in a losing trade, period. It's the worst thing you can do. And it's really, it's really um, a place where you need to be forgiving of yourself, right? You need to almost like um, be really glad that you tried and that you did something rather than you didn't do something and it's much easier to take a small loss as, as hard as it taking any loss is from an ego perspective right. than, than, um, than taking a big loss right and and so um, if you if you find yourself overconfident uh, that doesn't happen too often in, in, in traders who are around a long time because 8 out of 10 people who trade lose everything. So that means theoretically 8 out of 10 trades we make are wrong. So that you need to keep a pretty short lead. So then the key to success is not necessarily letting your winners ride but because they are less frequent. But the, the key to success would be to cut your losses quicker than anybody else. Right. And then try again. Right. And, and so um, the, these are that question is a great question from the person who's truly trying to get involved. And so um, it doesn't always have to be pretty, right? Our job is to make money, right. and so right, we may take two or three losses before we make it back. But as long as those losses are small, and that can be just like a handle on the S and P, or three ticks in the bonds, or twenty-five cents in crude, or you know, a buck and a half in gold. And so. Um, a great question, whoever asked that, and I applaud them for struggling through that because, um, you know, just just keep at it. I think that's great, great uh, stuff there. Um, okay, we'll continue to take a couple more questions here, and guys, just to reiterate again, uh, Chris is going to be joining us for an in-depth, much more in-depth in in investigation to a lot of. Sorry, I got New York City traffic outside my apartment here, honking horns. We're going to be doing much more in-depth. Um, discussion of a lot of the concepts that Chris has been touching on in this and plus you know a lot more on trading psychology in the next session of the master course which starts up in mid-December 
if you want to learn more about the master course, you can go to sanglucci.com forward slash MC. Uh, we have a couple, we have one pretty big discount coming out here um, for like Black Friday, Cyber Monday. If you're interested in that, feel free to just speak up in the chat now or email me, charlie at sanglucci.com, um, and I'll get you more information on that and what's included. Um, so we have a question from Monchero. Who is it? That is, that, I, that's the, uh, they're cleaning up here behind me, so. Yeah, that's all right. There's only so much we can control. Uh, this is a good meditation metaphor here, right? Um, so Ronchero asks, what was your moment that brought you to the conclusion that you had to have more mastery over your emotions? Like, was there a time, was there an experience you had trading where you just got your ass handed to you and you were just like, I need to get, I need to get control over this? Well, oh yeah, the easiest, the easiest way to approach that is, is, um, is when you're trying to make the transition to trading bigger and and uh, that was many years ago where I had to write on the top of my trading card breathe as though you're you're holding your breath and so um, breath is a mental function right and so at the top levels of the tennis match right they're choking it's not a physical choke it's a mental choke right. and so uh, and trading itself is essentially behavioral finance. It's expectations of people, um, and generally, people. Uh, it's, I had a friend of mine, uh, Mr. Cohen, used to talk about trading as like a bad marriage. Like people had to go every day to deal with this thing that they they were they were confronted with all their fears, all their hopes. Um, people tend to act out their emotional problems under stress, um, and so. Uh, the people who could think clearly while the present moment is unfolding uh, were the people who were able to adjust on the fly, either increase their position, decrease their position, uh, exit the trade, reverse, one of the hardest things to do. And so the, it's, uh, like we said, it's a roller coaster that you step on and off wherever, the, wherever it is that you choose to step on and off. And the only thing that's stopping you is your ability to, to negotiate the transitions emotionally um, and and part of that, right, is like, okay, am I right? Am I wrong? How quickly am I uh, am I able to admit I'm wrong, um, uh, or reverse even? Uh, remember, we were talking about the craving and aversion, and what is your intention, right? If you really are craving to have the trade or the position on, maybe take a step back. If you don't want to trade, right? If you don't want this position anymore, right? Those are the big emotions that affect a lot of traders. And right. so, um, just be really careful um, of your own mental state. So in my case, was there, I mean, the 87 crash was, was something else. I mean, there were guys in the S&P pit coming out with tears in their eyes. Right. You know, I think it was Soros on one side and Jones on the other. One, I think Sor Soros was selling the low and Jones was paying 10 handles higher across the ring. Well, we said Jones, Paul Theodore Jones. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, hundred lot was half a million dollars, and these guys were just, you know, they were, and so, uh, so you want to take a half a million dollar swing and, and trying to scalp? I mean, so you really have to make sure that you're good with, you know, with all of a sudden you have a, a big position on. It's it's paralyzing. Right. A lot of it's a deer in the headlights experience. Where so you want to make sure that you have full control of your emotions uh, at all times, and that's why it's critical that you're not overstepping your bounds and you're well rested. Right. right and you're right. not and you're not fighting the market. Don't forget that. Right. It's like it's bigger than we are. Right. Um, Young has a Young. I, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right, but has a has a question. Do you do you do meditation practice? If so, what's your what's your meditation practice? You know, there are so many of them that are, are good. Um, the simple emptiness meditation practice of, you know, I am, you know, there's, well, first of all, there's a progression, okay, and there's many good places to do that. So there's simple progressions on first shamatha, right, the ability to just watch your breath come in and out of your nose um, ten times. Um, uh, then there's all sorts of practices to go from there. I gladly uh, would suggest anybody to study a shamatha meditation program. Uh, John Yates, Y-A-T-E-S, 
E S. His his name is Kula Dasa with a C. Has a great book called The Mind Illuminated. It's just out. Uh, it's probably the best handbook and and recipes, so to speak, the directions, the protocols, progressions for meditation, as taught by a neuroscientist with lay vows. Um, he's he's great. I've done month long meditations with him. Uh, uh, you know, it's. Um, but again, meditation is something that can happen in front of the screen, um, in a sense. It's the screen doesn't care if you are doing well or not. Uh, just like the ocean doesn't care if you're surfing, if it's if you're having a good time, or the mountain if you're a skier. The mountain doesn't really care if you're having a good time or not. And so the the meditative element of all of that is to understand that it's that it's your interactions, and that you're completely accountable, and that. There is no excuse other than what you're thinking and what you're doing. And the, right. me the meditative process slows down the brain enough so that you can see those decisions actually happening slowly in front of you or the thoughts happening slowly in front of you. Once you get adept at that, then you just take it out into the marketplace. So right. meditation is just a stepping stone for being able to participate in the markets in an effective manner. Right. Um... Matt, yeah, the uh, the book is called um, The Mind Illuminated, and I'll grab a link real quick for that. Um, um, Chris, another question here from Clint. Um, have you had to deal with a close-to-blowout scenario in the past? How did you deal with it? Uh, yeah, um, in 2000 in the Dow, uh, Clint, I was short calls, uh, and the Dow went up 600 points in three days. And... Uh, it drained my account to flat, and I walked up to the clearing firm, and they said, you look like death. And I was like, yeah, I just lost everything in my account. They said, well, go make it back. We'll cover you. Um, but that took a while. And um, so the idea is, is um, yes, it's happened. It's happened to most everybody. Um, that's, a, that's a huge success. And uh, I do not recommend it at all. It's the worst experience. Um, so that's what it teaches you to... You know, some real humility about getting out of losers fast and and then um, trade small be really small and remember that um, stuff happens right way out of your control like 9-11 I was short puts into 9-11 and uh, it was you know because the market people knew it was down five days in a row before September 11th go back and look and uh, so people definitely know things before they're going to happen. So just, you know, if you don't understand it, just don't do it. Or, or tread extremely lightly. Or, yeah, just, you know, if you see the crazy person, just, you know, give them a wide berth. Right, right. And so when you came back, when you took that sort of devastating loss, um, you know, and, you, and the clearing firm said, you know, go back and go out and make it back, I mean, the process for that was to start back out just trading small and, and just really trying to get the overall amount that you had to make back outside of your head and just focus on day to day or how, how did you claw back? Well, um, uh, the, the Jewish, uh, the Israeli prime minister in the, in the seven day war told Joe Biden some story about we had a secret weapon and he was like, what's our secret weapon? What's your secret weapon? And she, I think it was Golda Meir. She said, we have no other choice. Right, like their backs are to the walls. That's our secret weapon. And in a sense, in my case, right, I didn't have the Ivy League pedigree. I couldn't go get a job at Goldman. I had to make it back. And I love stories where you see these venture startups or young kids starting to trade. And I've taught a bunch where they have no other choice. Right. And so when when you're faced with these desperate situations, um, you generally see the best in people. Yeah. So, um, uh, the flip side of that is what a term called forced awareness. You don't want to buy a stock at 10 and then it goes to 9 and then you're like, oh, it's so cheap. And then it goes to 8 and you're like, I can't believe how cheap it is. And then you're like at 7. It's like they're giving it away. And then the next day you wake up, it's trading 4. And you're like, fuck. Oh. Like, that's called a forced awareness where the loss is so big that you become forcefully aware of how wrong you are. Right. And in trading, make sure you avoid any sort of situation where there's forced awareness. You never, ever, ever want to be forcefully made aware of this by the size of your loss. So that would be a lesson right there from for Clint. Clint, who is a good trader, by the way. Great trader. Right. Got you. Um, okay, last question here, and then we'll, we'll wrap up. But, guys, if you have more questions for Chris or more questions about 
know his involvement, what he's going to be talking about in um, you know in the master course interview that we that we bring in with him. Definitely don't hesitate to email me charlie at sanglucci dot com. Uh, and then um, in, in, if you have specific questions for Chris, I'm sure he's happy to to answer some of these via email too. Uh, but um, last question here. I mean, what do you think about paper trading, Chris, in terms of people kind of getting a better feel for their experiences? Some people say there's no substitute for for live trading, live action, but you know, you also want to. I mean, um, it's um, what do they say? You can, you can tell somebody about the ocean um, and describe it to them if they say they've never seen the ocean, and then you can take them to the ocean and then show them the ocean. And uh, and Pete Pete uh, Stoudemire told a great story years ago about he had a friend who he put in the bond ring, and the guy stood there with his uh, point and figure in the bond ring for for uh, like six months, and uh, didn't make a trade. He was paper trading, and Pete finally walked in the ring and said, "What do you think?" And the guy goes, "I think it's going up." And Pete goes, "Sold you a hundred." And the guy he goes, and Pete laughed, and he goes, "That's you know," he said, "You know, enough is enough." At a certain right. point, right? right. You have you have to make the leap. So, um, yeah, great, uh, but it's an experience. I mean, you were born with this human body, as dumb as it sounds, you, and you have good teachers, and you have all this opportunity. Um, you might as well ramp it up and really, you know, try within reason, not not to uh, not to scare yourself, but get out there and try it. You know, what do they say? Stand on the playing field. Put your uniform on and stand on the playing field. Right. right. Get out. Yeah. Yeah, pull the trigger and get out into it. Yeah. So, sure. all right, guys. Well, I think we're gonna wrap it up with that. Um, you know, tons of, of good information here. I mean, Chris, unless there's anything you feel like we left out that you wanted to, to touch on, not necessary, but you know, if there's anything you left out, or we left out. We can um, yeah, just thank it. I really thank everybody for coming. I hope I can help. Uh, if you have any questions, don't hesitate to ask. Um, I know it's hard. And so keep trying and uh, take care of yourself, right? Avoid burnout and uh, stay curious and courageous. And always, right, if you're experiencing anxiety, choose curiosity. Right. Yep, there we go. Spoken, spoken from a seasoned meditator and, uh, and trader right there, guys. So um, thank you, Chris, for your time. Thanks, everybody, for joining. Uh, again, if you guys want more from Chris, check out the map, of course. Um, email me for questions on, on discounts and whatnot that are coming up here. Thanglucci.com forward slash MC. Uh, we will see you guys in the next interview that we, that we set up here. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Ben.